Okay, hello everyone. My name is Patrick Hofner and I am from Graz University of Technology. This talk is about movements of the same upper limb can be classified from low frequency time domain EEG signals. This is rather a complicated title, but basically this is about a, a new non-invasive control approach for neuroprothesis. A neuroprothesis can be realized with a functional electrical stimulation. You have an electrical stimulator and you cleverly place electrodes on the arm of a spinal cord injured person. In that way, you can restore several uh, movements. For example, opening or closing the hand. And because we are PCI researchers, we want to control a neuroprothesis with brain signals. Non-invasively, we can realize this with uh, in an EEG system and by detecting sensory motor rhythms. But sensory motor rhythms have, or let's call it sensory motor rhythm based PCIs, have two main limitations. First, they only support a low number of control classes, usually one to three classes. And second, the control of such a PCI is somehow unnatural. For example, a foot motor imagination is used to control the right hand, or the left hand imagination is used to control, control the right hand. This is clearly unnatural. But there may be a solution for that. Low frequency time domain signals. They were shown to encode information about trajectories, movement directions, and movement intention. And we analyzed if these low frequency time domain signals can be also used to classify different movements of the same limb. And this has two important implications. First, we would get more control classes. And second, the control would be more natural. For example, the person imagines an opening of the right arm hand, and the neuroprothesis actually opens the right hand. So we have a direct link between the imagination and the executed movements. But to be clear here, um, this was an initial study and we started with executed movements in healthy persons. That being said, I show you the, our experimental setup. The subjects sat in a chair and their right hand was supported by a Hokoma Amero spring. This was a, re a rehabilitation device. And then they executed several movements. We recorded the EG, of course, and the joint angles of the hand, the hand and the, fi the arm and the fingers with the Mayo and the data glove. This was done to uh, detect the movement onset of the movements. And we also recorded the electrode positions for source imaging. Now I would like to show you the six different movements. So this was hand opening, hand closing, uh, pronation, supination, elbow extension, and elbow flexion. So six movements. And we also recorded a rest class, but this rest class uh, is not, was not analyzed for this talk now. The sequence of the trial uh, looked like this. So at second zero, a cross appeared on the screen together with a beep. And at second two, a cue asked the u was, used, was shown to the user and asked the user to execute a movement. And importantly, the user executed the movements right after the cue and they moved back to the rest position after the end of the trial. So this was a single movement, not a repetitive movement. We had six movements, one rest class, which was not analyzed, the rest class. We uh, recorded 60 trials per class, and we recorded 15 uh, healthy subjects. Now let's switch quickly to the signal processing. Uh, we recorded 61 EG channels, and to um, obtain the low frequency time domain signals, we applied a pampas filter from 0 0.3 to 3 hertz and we classified the signal with a shrinkage LDA classifier. And because it was a multi-class problem, remember six movement classes, we used a one versus one classification strategy. Finally, we validated our results with a 10 times 10 cross-fault validation. So classification was one important point. The second important point are the classifier sources. We were interested in what are the sources behind the classifier. And the first idea would be to interpret directly the weights of the classifier. But 
those weights are hard to interpret because those weights in, uh, correspond to a filter. But we want to obtain a pattern. This is the same basically as with common spatial patterns. If you want to interpret a common spatial pattern, you look at the pattern, not at the filter. And this is the same case with classifiers, or with an LDA classifier. And therefore, to obtain uh, the pattern for the classifier, we used a method called discriminative spatial patterns. We had six classes, and because it was a one versus one classification strategy, we uh, also had 15 binary classifiers. And because we had 15 classifiers, we also had 15 patterns. And then we transformed these patterns from the channel space to the source space by using Brainstorm, a template, brain model, and s -Loretta. Maybe this is more clear when I show you this picture here. So we have had six classes, then uh, afterwards 15 binary classifiers, 15 patterns corresponding to these classifiers. We transformed these patterns to the source space. Then we took the absolute average over all 15 patterns, and finally uh, we averaged over one second. And this was one pattern for one subject. Now let me turn to the, uh, to the results. First the classification accuracies, then the pattern. The classification accuracies are shown on the left side. We can see all 15 subjects and the average. The average is the black thick line here. And second zero corresponds to the movement onset. So this was not the Q, this was the movement onset. Actually when they really started the movement. And the dashed horizontal line is the significance level. And we can see that the uh, average reaches um, a maximum classification accuracy of around 40% uh, right after the movement onset. And the classification accuracy uh, became uh, significant more than 500 milliseconds before the movement onset. Next, I would like to show you the confusion matrix because it was a multi-class problem. Sometimes this is useful here. We can see the true class labels and the predicted class labels of flexion, extension, supination, pronation, elbow, uh, hand closing, and hand opening. We can see here that um, movements involving the same joints are often intermixed with each other. So for example, if the subjects opened the arm or their hand, this was often detected as a hand closing, or a pronation was often detected as a supination. Okay, the next point is then the classifier pattern. This is the pattern, um, what, what we see here is the median over all 15 subjects. And we, we can see that the supplementary motor area and the contralateral motor cortex and code, they uh, contain the discriminative information as used by the LDA classifier. So, <coughs> To conclude now, we have shown that single movements of the same limb can be classified from EEG. So that's good news for, uh, that's good news for uh, neuroprothesis control. And as, as, we heard, as we have heard before, executed movements are the best simulation for attempted movements in spinal cord injured persons. And classes involving different joints are easier to discriminate. So it's better to discriminate, it's easier to discriminate um, supination and elbow than supination and pronation. The patterns originate from motor areas. That means we indeed decoded from brain signals and not from movement artifacts. And the classification accuracy were, classification accuracies were significant before the movement onset. So that's also important for spinal cord injured users uh, who, of course, cannot execute movements anymore. And the next step will be to uh, conduct this same study in end users with attempted movements. And if you're further interested in more details here, we also have a poster presentation in the evening. One final point here now. Um, next year, the International BCI Conference will be hosted again in Austria. And if you're interested, please find flyers at the registration desk. So finally, uh, I would like to thank the Morgas project and the Filio Reach project, which facilitated this research, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. <laughs>